Hey guys, this is Malekith. Uh Welcome to my sort of beginner's tutorial guide to uh, Crusader Kings 2. Um, this is the full version of the game, but uh, for the purpose of this tutorial I have picked this uh, Duchess Matilda, which is this province here from the Holy Roman Empire, who is one of the playable characters in the demo. So if you only have the demo and you're trying out the game to see if uh, it's for you, you can pretty much follow what I'm going to go through and uh, you should be able to get a feel for the game that way. So uh, to start with I'll just do a basic overview of the user interface. So up here in the top left you have the, the current leader you're playing as. Um, so if you click open this you get all the information about her. Um, in this game you, you don't play as a specific country per se, you play as a, a family of people within that country. Um, if you manage to make it up to the ruler of king then arguably you are that country but it, it's all about the family ties so when this person dies you'll play as their legal heir um, if it's a part of your family and it, I'll get into that in a bit more detail. So uh, we've clicked this open so you've got your character's name, their age, um, obviously their, their portrait, if they're married they'll have uh, their husband or wife in here. You've got your coat of arms on the left here. Um, the heir is who inherits your land when you die so in this case it goes to um, the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire because you have no sort of people to inherit from you at the moment. Uh, if you're not a king, um, in the top right here you'll see a, um, a liege. So if you're a count that will be the duke above you. If you're a duke that will be the king above you. Um, if you're, I don't think you can be a king with an emperor above you but don't hold me to that. But basically, th this guy is uh, he's the one that will tell you what to do. He'll raise some of your troops to use in his own wars. Um, it's normally a percentage. I'll cover that in a minute. Um, you have to pay taxes to him. But at the same time, he, he should technically come and protect you uh, if you start getting attacked by external forces. Um, okay, so then we have titles. So this is all the, the sort of the land claims you have. So if we start from the right, the county of Spoleto, which is there so that's owned so if you click on a piece of land you can see who owns it by uh, the, the picture that comes up on the left here so equally you've got Siena which is there uh, Firenze which is in there oh, all the way across so that's all the counties and then this one's got a slightly different symbol about it you can see that's the the duchy which is the the duke role so you've got the the dukedom of Spoleto which only contains that one county. But then if we click on the Dukedom of Toscana you can see that includes all of these different counties. So you, you technically have a, a say in what all of the people in these counties are doing. Uh, claims. If I had a claim on any other territory, so say it used to be mine and someone captured it off of me, um, you'd get a, a claim icon come up in there and that's a, it's a called a casus belli. It's a, a reason for you to be able to declare war on whoever currently owns it to go get it back off of them. Uh, on the right here, you've got the dynasty tree. If I click into that, so you can see who your characters, sort of siblings, parents, etc., were, and trace that all the way back. Or um, later on, when you've had like several hundred years of playing, this will be a, a lot larger, and you'll have branches going off in all directions so you can trace who your family ties and therefore allies are. You've got a, a more direct sort of family tree which uh, just follows your line of the, the family so you can it goes back a lot further um, but if it branched off up here to another family you wouldn't see that in this view. And the realm tree shows who the overall liege of the the realm you're in, which in this case is the Holy Roman Empire is, which you can then expand out to all the people underneath him and then all the people beneath those and so on and so forth. That's um, quite a large, you know, you can see even toggle it full screen up here and then it expands down. Um, I've not personally had a, any cause to use that but then in my playthrough you'll see that I'm a king um, and so I don't really need to worry about how I interact with the other people on an equal level in my kingdom as there is no one else on equal level. Um, whereas if you're a duke or a count you probably want to keep an eye on relations of other people in the realm 
um, see if you can sort of take advantage of marrying their children or you know anything like that. So here you have the house coat of arms. Uh, the sort of nationality of your character. Um, that's quite important because as you'll see in my playthrough, um, although we're an island, my leaders tend to be either Frankish or Germanic in origin, which means that anyone that's Irish doesn't isn't likely to like them as much as they could do if they were Irish because it's basically they're a foreign leader. Um, Catholic is uh, the religion, obviously. Um, if you go down into here and click on some other people, you'll see the Sunni Muslim. Um, over here is, should be Orthodox Christian. They'll be pagan as well somewhere. If we go back into our own character. Um, this one here is where they're currently located. Uh, with female characters, they tend to always pretty much stay in the home province, indicated by the shield here. Um, with male characters, when you raise armies, they do tend to lead the army. So that can be useful in tracking them down as they march around the screen if you need to find them for some reason. So beneath that you have uh, the current gold balance, which is for your character will just be represented up in the top right here as well. Uh, their, their prestige, how much piety they have, and a score. I'll cover what each of those are when I get to that part of the interface. To the left of that you have the sort of abilities of the character in the, the main different areas. So the top one's diplomacy. I generally like to have a high diplomacy score as it allows extra sort of options in your um, chats when you're dealing with vassals. So if they come up demanding more money uh, to pay their taxes directly from you or lower the tax rate, if you have a high diplomacy value you'll get a third option which is basically you tell them diplomatically to get lost. But if you don't have a high diplomacy value then you're forced to either give them money or lower their taxes. So I, I find that one's quite useful. Uh, Marshal is your ability to lead the military. So if you've got a king that's going to go off leading armies, that's obviously a good one to have. Uh, stewardship's your uh, ability to deal with money. Um, I believe you collect taxes at better ability if that's quite high. Uh, intrigue is your ability to plot and backstab and come up with underhand plans for you know, usurping other people's kingdoms and uh, assassinating people, all those sorts of things. Um, and the bottom one is learning. This is generally tied in with the religious sort of side of things. Um, people with high learning are usually members of the church. Um, I'm not sure what impact it directly has on you as a leader. It may allow you to uh, gain piety with the church and sort of be more respected in that regard. I'm not entirely sure. Um, below that you'll have the traits of the character. So she's zealous which gives her a bonus to piety every month and increases her martial score, which is the uh, the military one. Uh, she's patient, so she gets plus one to intrigue, diplomacy, stewardship and learning. She's diligent, which again, you can see there's a huge list of plus ones in there. And uh, she's a charismatic negotiator. Everyone tends to have one of these stats on the far left, at least initially, which is sort of a, a major player in the determining of their personality. So if we go to the liege, for example, his is a skilled tactician, which uh, obviously gives him a lot of bonuses to war-based sort of things. Uh, if you look at his wife, she's an amateurist plotter. Um, that usually comes when they stop being a child and come of age, they will get sort of assigned one sort of specific high-level skill, and then the others they inherit as they go through life. So if you look at the parents, they should have a few more. So you've got gluttonous, which is basically he ate too much. He's cruel, so he loses some diplomacy but gains some intrigue. Greedy, you get more tax but less diplomacy. And he's a naive appeaser, so his military abilities not so good, but his diplomacy is good. Um, you do have some control over those. You'll get sort of little events that pop up that ask you, do you want to eat lots of food or not? And it will tell you in the text the chances you have of getting a new ability and what that ability is. Right, so we'll uh, that's this bit done now. So then if you have a look down here you've got your family, so who your parents were. Um, the little skull indicates they're dead and it, if you hover over it it gives you the date and their death and their age at it. The, the little blood drop shows that they're blood related to you. Um, 
I'm not quite sure why the mother here doesn't have a blood drop. It seems a bit odd. So as you can see, she has no children at the moment. But uh, I'll come back to marriage in a minute. So then you have vassals. Now these guys are the people that own, or not own, you've assigned them to look after the territories for you. So if we take Bresica for an example, which is the sort of the capital area, this flag up here indicates that you yourself are personally taking care of the castle here. But if you have a look down here at the city and the uh, sort of the church of this region, you can see they have different flags. So we've basically assigned other people, in this case this guy, to look after the, the city for us and another one to look after the church. So they become your vassals, which you can see him in here under the vassals tab. So you can see how much you're getting from him in tax each year and his opinion of you. So a good thing to do is sort by opinion and look for whoever's the lowest um, to try and keep an eye on negative numbers. Uh, and in the case of bishops, you will see their opinion of the current pope. If, you're, if their opinion of you is higher than their opinion of the pope, the tax money comes to you. If their opinion of the pope is higher, it goes to the pope instead. So you need to try and keep bishops happy if they are bringing in money. You then have court. Um, this is sort of anyone related to your family. Um, generally anyone working on your council, which I will get to in a minute. And you just have some general courtiers around who don't currently own land or s sort of that anything like a title, but uh, are available for you to use in some way. Allies, she currently has none. In here, you'd, it's normally people with blood ties to you. So say you've got a, a brother that somehow inherits some land somewhere else in the, in the area, he'd generally come up as an ally. Um, if you were playing as the kingdoms of Spain, uh, you've got Leon, Castile and Galicia. The three kings of those are all brothers. So if you were playing as this faction in here, you would have these two as allies. There's a couple more over here uh, because they're from family ties. You can also get those through marriage, but I'll come back to marriage in a second. Um, and abroad is courtiers who are currently elsewhere. I've never had any use to use this at all, really. Um, it's sort of if you're imprisoned or being educated somewhere. So if we come to the marriage part now. So you click on the arrange marriage tag and you get basically a list of all of the eligible people in the uh, the game. So the little blue flag here indicates that you'd get an alliance out of doing it. So that's one thing to keep an eye on. Um, age is also important. If they're not, if they're still a child, which I think is below 16, um, you, firstly they have this little child-looking picture. You can't directly marry them. You have to sort of set up an agreement that you will marry them later when they become of age, called a betrothal. But uh, these filters along the top are what's useful can uh, find people that have a high opinion of you already. Rank's a good one. So you can see this guy's the Duke. Uh, you've got an Earl, Count. So if you were trying to marry up into sort of powerful positions, that's a good one to filter on. Uh, culture is another one. So if you wanted to specifically marry someone of German origin, you would uh, sort by culture and find the German part of the tree. Uh, realm also sort of gives you an idea of where they are on the global map. Um, another thing that you could often want to marry for is the, the partner of the leader takes a percentage of the partner's stats. So if you had, say, a really low martial skill and you wanted to boost her martial skill up, you'd marry a guy with a high martial skill and that would boost yours slightly. Um, if you're marrying other people off, a good thing to sort on is ambition, which isn't coming up at the moment. But um, you will find characters have ambitions, and if you see little love hearts in here, that means they've got an ambition to be married. And if you do actually marry them off to someone, they will get a bonus to their opinion of you for you fulfilling their ambition, basically. So just to marry this woman off, I'll have a look at rank. Um, let's go with this Scottish guy. So what you get is you uh, you have to pay very careful attention to this line up here. 
because there's two types of marriage. There's a, a standard marriage and a matrilineal marriage. If you're a male character, you want a standard marriage because that means that any children come off of the male's family tree and therefore you get to play as them when you die. If you're a female character like I am and you do that, any of the children come off the male part of the tree, therefore they're not your direct descendants, they're his, and you will not have anyone to play as. You'd have to kill him off and remarry someone with a matrilineal marriage. Um, you'll find a lot of high-ranking people are not interested in matrilineal marriages because it means that they are too far down the order of inheritance to, um, you know, they're effectively ending their family line by marrying you and they're just not willing to do that. So you can hover over this little scroll here and it sort of gives you a breakdown of the sort of the pluses and negatives that affect the decision. So you can see he's got a, a reasonable opinion of me, so that's three pluses. Uh, my age is quite low, which is something that he likes, so that's plus two. The skills he feels are suitable, so that's plus two as well. He's got a minus one and for prestige effects, which is basically he's marrying, uh, I think he's marrying down, yeah, he's a prince and I'm only a duke or a duchess, so he's sort of marrying down you know, he's not marrying a princess, so that's a minus one. And then you just have a base reluctance to get married that you have to overcome. But uh, he seems happy enough, so that's a, a yes for there. So we gain 22 prestige out of that. It results in an alliance, so then you just send. And after a period of time, I think it's five or seven days or something like that, it you get a response. But uh, So that's everything in the the main character tab covered. So next you have council. Now these are the guys that pretty much help you rule your land. Um, you have a chancellor who is entirely based off of the diplomacy stat so you want to find people with a high diplomacy stat. If yours is particularly low or he has a negative opinion of you, you can replace him by clicking a point and then you will have a, a list. By default it sorts by the stat that you want so the person at the top of the list is usually the best to uh, select but you want to keep an eye on their opinion of you and also some of their stats um, you know their traits in here if it says underhanded backstabber you probably don't want to be hiring them as your spy master um, which is someone who's meant to be trying to keep you alive so he's got the highest in that his abilities he can improve diplomatic relations so you'd click this button and you'd click a province that you want to send him to and he would try and get your uh, opinion up with the people in that province it'd be the the duke that owns or count that owns it um, but also the vassals underneath it uh, you can fabricate claims this is how you get a claim in here to go to war against any other christian nation where you can't declare holy war so if i wanted to attack lombardia here for example i would have to go fabricate claims and put him in there and you'll see there's a 10% a chance per year that he will succeed in getting that claim. So it can take quite a while. If you watch my Irish playthrough, you will see I have huge problems in actually securing claims, um, attacking the Christian areas of Scotland and England. And I end up giving up and instead come down to Spain to attack the Muslim nations as you don't need a claim like that to attack them. You can just declare holy war and charge straight in basically. His last one is so dissent, so you can put him in here, and that tries to reduce the opinion of the sort of the town and the church owner's view of his own lord. So the people in charge of these three here would start to dislike this guy, um, which means you can cause all sorts of revolts and rebellions and just generally sow chaos in their territory. So then you have the marshal. He's uh, sort of deals with leading your armies and making sure they get better. So you have suppress revolts. If you've got some rebellious provinces, you can click that, put it on the put him in the province and he will reduce the chance that they will rebel against you. Um, train troops, if you put him in a province when you're training um, sort of levies to replace lost soldiers, he'll, the reinforcement rate, so the rate you get your soldiers back after they've died in that province goes up by 60% in this case. But he also increases the size of the army that you can actually hire from that place by 30%. Uh, 
So you generally want to put that in your largest population province where you're getting the biggest armies anyway, because it's a percentage modifier. And the last one is research military technology, which I will come to when we get to the technology tree. So your steward, he deals with money, he can gather taxes, so you can put him in a province and get more money out of that province. There is a reasonable chance that he will be attacked by the peasants. Um, and in a couple of cases I've had people die from being attacked by the peasants. Uh, he can oversee construction, so if you're upgrading your castle, he can reduce the time that it takes for the castle to sort of be built. Or he can research economy tech, which again I'll cover when we get to research. Uh, your spy master is very important. He can uncover plots, so you basically want to use this at nearly all times, and I'll demonstrate now. So you click it, and you click where you want him, and you'll see him appear on the map. So now if any plots are happening against characters within this province, he will detect them. Um, and as this is where my leader is situated, you want, you nearly always want that on, unless you're in a very stable sort of uh, region, because it will stop people trying to assassinate your leader. Uh, he can also build a spy network, which means that you have a, an increased chance to be able to assassinate someone. So if I click into his tab, you have the option to assassinate, and it will give you a percentage chance and a percentage you'll be discovered. Uh, the chance of success will go up if you've got him using that ability, the uh, build spy network in that region, um, and that increases over time. So it's not an instant drop him in and you've suddenly got it you know, sort of sorted. You, it, you have to leave him in there. Um, and study technology is the other one, which is something I will cover. The last one is your court chaplain. He's obviously a religious man. Um, you can head the local inquisition, which converts people to your faith. So if you were down here fighting the Muslims and you capture one of the bits of territory, the, the territory itself will be of Muslim sort of um, you know, disposition, and you want it to be Catholic so that you can actually get something out of it and rule over it. So you want to put him in there, and he will do his best to firstly sort of convert them to Catholic, but also any leaders in their sort of vassals um, that are sort of misbehaving uh, religiously, he can sort of ex uh, not excommunicate, sorry, he can brand them as a heretic, which then means you can sort of take action against them. Um, imprison them and so forth. Uh, he can also research cultural tech, which again I'll come to at the research. And the final one is final one is improve religious relations. So you can use him to improve your relations with your various bishops. Which if I go back to the the vassals, so you say this guy here had a a higher rating w with the pope than he did with you, which means his gold's going to the pope. You could drop your chaplain in on his territory, and he would attempt to raise this opinion. It, it's sort of a separate way of raising the opinion other than using the Chancellor to do so. Um, so that covers that. And if you ever forget which stat you need to look for, just the little symbols are up the side here. And one thing that's vitally important is you keep the uh, opinion of the Spy Master high. He's the guy protecting your backside from assassinations, so keep him happy. Um, if anyone ever manages to involve him in a plot against you, you're pretty much done for. Because he's the guy that would normally tell you that plots are happening, and if he's in on them, you've got no chance really. So the next one across is laws. Um, first thing to highlight is you have the laws for your dukedom, and the laws for the empire as a whole. Um, it's worth noting that distinction, and if you own multiple kingdoms, so in say my playthrough, I've got the Kingdom of Ireland and the Kingdom of Spain, or sorry, Castile. They're two separate sets of laws, you need to keep an eye on them. So at the top here, you have the type of um, inheritance law. So agnatic, cognatic, is um, basically that males will inherit, but if there are no males, then a female can inherit. Um, agnatic means it's males only, which means no women can inherit. If you don't have a male heir, that's the end of your line, you're buggered. Um, An absolute cognatic means that men and women inherit on exactly the same grounds. So if the firstborn was a woman, she would inherit, regardless of how many men are behind her. Um, and you can always sort of 
see what they mean by hovering over them. Equally, you can see the conditions that you have to have to uh, be able to get them by hovering over the question mark next to it. So you can see we can't have absolute cognatic because we have uh, there's an X in there next to have culture Basque. So you can see the little hammer to select it, it's greyed out. It's worth noting you can only change these once per leader. So if she changed this one, that's it. She can't change it back to something else again. You'd have to wait for the next person in the succession to take over and then they can change it. Um, you then have the succession laws. So gavel kind is that basically all of your territories are split between your various sort of children. Um, the eldest gets the highest title. So if you've got king and a load of dukedoms beneath it, the king title would go to the eldest child or you know the, the primary heir and then the rest would be split between everyone else um, there's not mm, I can't really see much point to having this the only benefit it gives you is you're allowed more pieces of land before you start hitting your limit which is something I'll cover shortly seniority means whoever the oldest person is gets it um, it's not necessarily your child. If you've got a brother that's older, he gets it. Uh, primogenitor. This is the one I usually go for, which means your eldest child inherits everything. Um, it does mean the children below the eldest child generally try to assassinate him and cause trouble, uh, rebel. and But it means that you've sort of got guaranteed succession of your family line, it keeps all your titles together and you know exactly who to keep an eye on in terms of people trying to rebel. And then elective, uh, your various dukes and uh, counts basically vote for who they want to be the next person. Uh, it's not something I would recommend if you're trying to ensure your line succeeds because you have to keep people very happy. So then below that we have the laws. So feudal levies is how much of their army the various vassals you have give you when you call up an army. Um, so you can see it's a percentage in the sort of hovering there. The higher you go, the less they think of you. At max, they basically give you every troop they have with none for their own defense. So they're not going to like that at all. I normally leave mine on normal. Uh, feudal taxation is how much you tax castles. Uh, city taxation is how much you tax cities, and church taxation is how much you tax churches. And then you've got levies for those guys as well, for, for how many troops the, count, uh, the town and the church would give you. If you're a king, you also have a crown authority and an investiture option. So crown authority is uh, how much power the crown has over the vassals below it. Um, I normally leave mine around medium because what medium does is it stops individual counts within your territory fighting amongst themselves for territory, but it doesn't put them under so much pressure that they dislike you that much, uh, which happens with high and absolute. So I would recommend medium as it gives you significant control over the people within your territory without causing huge amounts of issue from it. Okay, so next we have technology. So this is all of the technologies which are done on a, a province by province basis. As you can see, I'm moving around the map. These sliders are moving. Um, so if this is anyone in our domain, and this is anyone in the realm. So if you hover over the name, you can see what it does. So farming increases your castle tax. Trade practices increases your city tax. Um, I'm not going to go over all of them. You just need to look at them. Um, and then you can set a focus by clicking the little magnifying glass next to the one you want and that increases the chance of it being discovered over the others. So if you set your council members to do uh, economy research and then you clicked castle infrastructure focus, there's a much higher chance he will discover some castle infrastructure research than the others. So you just need to go through these yourselves, see what suits your time what, what you need at the time so if you're running sort of low on money going for any of the tax increases would be a, a good thing if you're in lots of fighting then improving your sort of castle and your 
so that your armor and weapons is obviously far more useful. So then we have the military tab. Um, okay, this is splits up. You've got your land armies here and your ships here. And then from that, it breaks down into three sections. The top one are your personal troops. You can raise these and keep these out as long as you need. No one will care. You just pay a, a monthly cost for their upkeep. Um, this is how many are available. This is how many you could have maximum. So if you click this button, you will see they come out and they will be from the various different provinces that you own. So that raises them. That's how much you'd pay a month to keep them out. And if you click this button again, they disappear. The next one down is your vassals. So that's sort of your churches and cities and anything that you don't directly own. So you can raise all these guys up like this. But if you keep these guys out for prolonged periods of time, the opinion of those vassals just drops because you basically they're paying for them. You're not getting a monthly cost, you can see. They're paying for those troops. So the longer you keep them there, the more of their money you're basically taking for your personal fighting. Um, so you need to... I tend to save these for desperate moments only. Or um, use them as defence when my army's out attacking stuff. Um, and just as soon as you don't need them anymore, dismiss them. And that will keep the happiness of your vassals up. And the higher tag is just if you've hired any armies, you can dismiss them from here. Um, you do have a view of your vassals below. You can raise individually by vassal. So if there's one in here that has really low opinion and you don't want to make him worse, you could hire everyone but his. Um, it also tells you how much each guy can actually raise and what type of unit it is. Um, which kind of unit is quite important because when you get into combat, as you'll see in my Let's Play video, uh, the, the armies obviously start at range and then they'll go through a phase where they shoot arrows at each other and then as they close in they go into melee range which is where the infantry here starts coming in and then you'll usually see that as one army breaks the cavalry will charge down the survivors or you'll have a cavalry charge at the start it very much depends on the general you just have to to watch a battle and see for yourself unfortunately I can't really show you at this point but your, your army composition is quite important you then have mercenaries so these guys you can hire. You have the cheap ones are at the bottom. So that's how much it would cost to hire them flat out. You know, that's your your upfront cost. You you give them this much money to even hire them to begin with. They will then have quite a high monthly cost. Um if we have a look, my monthly income is six point three five, so I could afford to sustain this army just once I'd hired it. If you ever reach zero gold and you have a mercenary army for hire they will generally either just leave completely just disappear or in some cases they will go rogue and come back and try to claim their money by taking one of your provinces off you you know they will siege your castle uh, the alternative is if you're in a war with someone else they will swap sides and join the other side um, obviously none of these are good so if you're down on your last gold piece and you have mercenary armies you want to pause the game come in here and dismiss these guys as quickly as possible Otherwise, it's going to come back and bite you. The third one is Holy Orders. So this is sort of your Crusader Knights. Uh, you can only really use these guys to fight against Muslim nations. Um, I think they disband and rebel and do all sorts of things if you try to use them against Christians. Um, to hire them, it costs you piety. And sometimes you have a monthly upkeep, sometimes you don't. It seems to vary. So that's the military tab. Intrigue. Now there's quite a bit going on in here. Um, sort of known plots is any plots that your spy master's discovered. They don't have to be against you. It could be two of your courtiers trying to kill each other, or you know your husband trying to kill somebody else. It it doesn't have to involve you directly, but it will appear in here. Prisoners are anybody you chuck in prison or anybody you capture in battle. You can ransom them, banish them from the kingdom, release them, uh, have them executed. There's, there's a whole range of things you can do. And ransoming them back is a good source of money. And then you have threats, which is uh, chances of revolt, 
So if one of your vassals is likely to revolt, it will appear in here with uh, the percentage of him revolting. But uh, above that, you have this list in here. So the ones at the bottom. So you can hold a summer fair. You'd click here. You can only do this between certain times of year, which if you hover over the scroll work with the tick at the end, it tells you when this is. Or the question mark gives you a better breakdown. Um, it would cost you gold, but then you get a series of events pop up and you make decisions and as a result various things happen. So you, you may hold a fair, you may hire some jugglers, they go down really well, everyone loves it, you gain some prestige. Um, it, it's sort of a, a series of events that pop up for you to answer and sort of it gives you bonuses that way. Uh, the ones at the top here, you can hire, basically pay for a new person to appear in your court for you to then use, you know, hire as a, a marshal or to put in your council or to marry off to someone. And the, the bit at the top here is uh, where you pick your ambition or set up a plot. So the top one's a mass wealth. So she wants, you basically set a goal for your character. So in this one, she would want to gain 500 gold. This one, she wants 500 piety, a thousand prestige, get married. Um, so I'll select that one at the moment as we've already arranged for the marriage, but because it's paused, it hasn't gone through yet. And when you complete them, you'll, uh, you'll sort of get bonuses to your character. Um, you know, people's opinion of you will go up or your, your character gains trait. It, it's worth keeping an eye on here. Um, if you had a husband and you wanted to kill him in there, you'd find a thing called a plot and you'd have a plot to kill your husband, um, which you can invite people to. And if you get it to a high enough percentage, you have a high chance of killing him off. Um, I believe I have done one of those in my playthrough. It's not something I'm going to be able to get to in this tutorial. Uh, diplomacy. So this is where you can sort of do anything to a specific person. I'll show there's an easier way to get to this. Say you click on this thing on Trent here. You see this guy's the leader. If you click here, this little scroll here, this takes you to the diplomacy tab for that specific person. And you can see declare war and it gives you crosses as to why it's grayed out. Send him a gift of money, assassinate, arrange marriage, so on and so forth. Religion, you can see all the bishops and what they think of you, what they think of the Pope. You can appoint who's going to replace them. You can see what the Pope up here thinks of you, who he's called Crusades on. It's not a, uh, a tab I use very often. And then characters lets you search every character in the game. There's all sorts of filters and stuff at the top. I'll just let you guys play with that. Okay, carrying on. You can. These are sort of major events that are going to affect your kingdom. So the first one is you have no heir to your dynasty. Um, it's basically an indicator this is going to be a problem. Do something about it. Uh, which is what we, we've done in trying to marry that guy. Well, they will hopefully then have children and then that will disappear as soon as there's a child. Uh, titles will lost in succession. This is basically saying because we have no heir, all of these titles will disappear out of your um, sort of ownership on the death of this character. So the other th you'll see because we've got gavel kind, this will pop up if we have two children. The child you're going to play as, the provinces he gains are fine because you're going to play as him. The second child will gain sort of half of these provinces, so you'll see this pop up again then. So as soon as I can, I want to change this to something else, which is very difficult as um, a Holy Roman Empire because the, uh, there's sort of some limiting factors on it. Uh, titles to be created. So you can create new titles. So in this case, it's the, the Dukedom of Medina. Which uh, to create you generally need gold and it will give you prestige and it's a title you can then either keep or give out. Uh, ruler unmarried, you know, it's just telling you you're not married. We've uh, sort of resolved that one already. Ducal claims. So this is basically saying that Rome should be part of because we got the dukedom of Spoleto. Rome should be part of our territory. Therefore, we do technically have a claim on it. Um, but as it's got the Pope in, 
I'm going to ignore that one. If you right click these you can get the disable completely or dismiss for now so that will only pop up again if it, that instance occurs again. So then top right you have your current gold, your current prestige, your current piety, your current uh, domain size I'll come to the, what these all mean in a second. Um, the the realm size and your current score for your uh, family. So gold, it's fairly obvious. That's how much money you have to spend on armies and upgrades and anything you like. Prestige is is basically um, sort of how royal and noble and that sort of stuff you are. Um, it's mainly a score modifier to go towards your final score, but it, you do find things that you can spend it on. Uh, piety is how religious you are, so you need it to hire holy orders. Um, there'll be some other things you can buy with it. The The higher it is, the, the better the church generally respects you as well. Um, this one here, the, the number on the left is how, much, how many provinces you personally control. So you own this castle, if there's another castle here and you own that, that would be two. Um, and then anywhere else you own, so Medina, so that's three. It's basically saying we own six out of a maximum of eight. If you go over the maximum amount, a lot of your vassals will start to dislike you. They basically think you own too much. You're being greedy and power hungry. And they will sort of start to rebel against you. Um, next one along is realm size, so that's the size of the, the entire realm I believe. Um, as you're only a duke in this case it, it's not something to worry about. And the score updates when you die, so when you die it, it sort of adds all of these numbers together and probably does some other maths and then puts a value in there. And uh, when you finally lose or the, you hit the end time, it's, uh, that'll have a final score and it will compare you to other families of that period. Um, so here you have the date, it starts at 1066, it ends in 1466. You have the, the speed faster and slower. If you click on this box here it pauses or unpauses, uh, it can also be done with the spacebar. Uh, over here you have high priority messages, so if somebody dies that's important or um, somebody's laid a claim on your kingdom, an anything important will come in this box. In here you've got lower priority ones, like you set your spy master to go uncover plots and your character wants to get married. Um, sorry, I'll stop changing that. Um, one tab I do like is this one that pops out here, which you lock with this button here. So this breaks down all of the uh, capitals in your under your command, shows you how much gold they're bringing in, what level their fort is at, and uh, how many troops are available. It also tells you what all of the people in your court are doing. Uh, when you have armies out, it will tell you how you, where your armies are, what they're up to. Um, if you're sieging somebody, it will give you a percentage that shows sort of how far through the siege has gone. Uh, it's just a very useful tab to have out at all times. Uh, another similar one is down here at the bottom. This plus symbol here is a message log. Uh, I do find having this useful. Uh, it it covers the whole game, not just your stuff happening to you, um, but it's useful if something happens and you're not quite sure what actually happened, you can look down here and sort of look back in through time a little bit and see what went on. So then down here you have the mini-map, which you can use to move around by clicking around on it. Um, I'll stop making you seasick. The filters down here are very useful. So the first one's terrain, that shows you sort of uh, rivers and forests and mountains and anything that might affect uh, your military. So if someone was defending in here and you attacked into it, they're going to be defending a river basically, or be in the hills, which will give them a defensive bonus. So it, it's useful from that perspective. Independent realms, if you scroll out, it shows the different countries. So France and Hungary and Poland, you know, and it has the name plastered across them, gives them an individual colour. Uh, the next one down is the ones I tend to use, which is diplomatic relations. So this lighter shade is the provinces that you directly own. The two uh, slightly darker shades here are your vassals, um, and anything that's not green isn't yours. 
and uh, anything that's this sort of color shows that you've got a claim on it. So if you're looking just above the mini map on the bottom right there, you can see there's a ducal claim on this province, and there's another one here. Um, it's also useful because you can hover over other provinces and see people's opinions of you. Um, I just generally like this view. Uh, you have religions, so Catholic, Sunni, Shiite, uh, Orthodox, sort of Norse, you know, you, you can just look around. Uh, cultures, so Irish, Saxon, Scottish, you know, Italian. It's not something I've generally used. Direct vassals. So it shows the. Um, so you can see this is all us, Toscana, and we're a vassal of the Holy Roman Empire. So it sort of shows the different vassals and all the land they own. Economy isn't something I've ever used before. I'm not entirely sure what it does. It doesn't seem to do very much at all. Um, pass on that one. It may start changing the shade depending on how much money things people are bringing in. Uh, it does seem to tell you how much money the tax is if you hover over the various provinces in the, the tooltip above the minimap. So I guess it's useful from that perspective. Uh, de jure dukedoms. So you can see that's the Spoleto de dukedom. So in having the duke title you could claim these ones. Kingdoms. So you've got the various kingdoms, which uh, is where you set up your kings. Then you've got empires, which in this case there's only two empires, the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. So they're the only places that can have emperors. Uh, revolt risk is a useful one. It would shade in red any province that's likely to revolt against you dynasties so you can get the names of the different sort of dynasties that are holding the lands at the moment and opinions so you've got a whole series of shaded sort of colors that show you their opinion of you and also if you hover over them it breaks it down so you can see this one doesn't like us minus 18 for being a foreigner and minus 10 for us being zealous and then being cynical So that's that. You then have some more down here. You can zoom in and zoom out. Uh, you can find a title, which is sort of. So if I wanted to find, let's say, Siena, you've got the county of Siena and the city of Siena, which is here. So if you know of something, in, but you're not quite sure where it is geographically, you can type that in there. Uh, go to your home province. Uh, a ledger. Which basically shows this stuff in a, a slightly more formal setting and the main menu and then you can minimize the message log so that was a rather long explanation of you know everything in this game there are tutorials that would cover all this and they would probably take about just as long to play through um, so if I unpause this and advance it for a little bit I can explain some extra stuff as it goes through So this is the first sort of event that pops up. So this is these two have got married. You have the option of if you hover over the first option, you can see you gain gold, or you can gain prestige. So this is basically you're paying for your wedding, or you get the realm to pay for your wedding. Um, so you'd want to see which one you need the most of. Consider your future plans. You know, if you're going to start raising armies, you'd probably want the gold. If you're not, then the prestige probably will come in more useful. Um, this is the, the sort of the guy who is responsible for the person we just married, saying yes, he accepts our marriage request. And you can see she's now fulfilled her ambition to get married. So then you can pick a new ambition. You can go in here. So here's this plot I was talking about. You can set up a plot to try and kill the prince. Um, I would just set up a, an ambition to have a daughter. We just accelerate it again until something else happens. So you'll get these little events pop up regularly. Uh, in this one, it's the peasants want to come into the city to sell their goods. The um, the owners of the city don't want that. The 
because uh, they cause hassle for them. So if you can side with the city owners, um, then you get an increased attack, uh, but the pe peasants are more likely to revolt, and the city owner will like you. If you side with the peasants, the city owner dislikes you. So it's entirely up to you. You need to balance. So if you click on his little portrait, you can see how much he likes you at the moment. Factor in how much that will sort of affect you. Um, do you want the money? Do you want to risk the peasants revolting? It, a lot of this game is reading the small print of these tooltips very carefully. Um, so there's a heresy somewhere. You can see there's little armies marching around. Um, the Pope has just stolen the title of Dukedom from us. I will explain why. So the Dukedom covered these three areas here. So this one, Spoleto and Rome. To claim the title you need to own two thirds of it. Which he clearly does and I clearly don't. So he would have paid a portion of gold to basically steal that title from me. Um, and he will now have a claim on my province if he wanted to go to war over it. So if you, you if you owned, say if I owned Spoleto and I wanted to get that back, I would have to fabricate a claim using my Chancellor. So fabricate claim in there. When he succeeded, I went to war, I captured that and I got that back, I could then usurp that title back because I would have two thirds of it, of the, the land that comes under that title. And then because I'm then the Duke, I would then have another claim to attack Rome because you know, technically that province is within my dukedom, therefore it should be mine. I could then attack Rome. Um, so a good example of that in my Irish campaign is I owned Galloway here which is part of this dukedom. So Carrick, which is there, Inisgall, which is up there, and I'm not sure where the last one is, and Argyle, which is somewhere, oh, this one here. So if I was to own these two and Argyle here, I would then be able to take the dukedom off of the, the guy who's currently got it, and use that to attack the fourth one because technically it should be mine as I'm the Duke of these lands. So let's carry on. Ah, okay, here's a tooltip. You'll see down here little faces pop up with percentages below them. This is all the wars you're currently involved in. So now because we're a duke, the king has decided that he wants to declare war on these guys up here. These are all the armies he's raised. You can see some of them have come from our lands. They're our soldiers, but they're under his control. Because he's our liege, he can basically go, I want a percentage of your army. And it just it goes, you don't have any decision on it. It's just taken. Much like you can just raise the vassal's armies, he can just take them and we will be paying for these troops. Um, even though we have no direct control over them. So he's going to march all this lot up here and have a huge fight. And here you'll see any battles that take place, who won, who lost, how much each side lost. Um, and that will con contribute to the war score percentage. Uh, any territories that he captures will go in here as occupation. That will contribute to the percentage. And once this gets high enough, this guy will generally try and surrender. And he'll either give up the territory or he'll lose some prestige, you need to read very, very carefully what the surrender terms say. Um, and also when you're declaring war, you need to read very, very carefully what the who you're declaring war on and why. So, as you can see, we could claim Spoleto. And if you look at this huge block of text, you need to read this carefully. It says, we're using our Casus Belli to put a claim on the Dukedom of Spoleto. Um, if we win, Duchess Matilda, which is us, gains the uh, th sort of that region. Um, in some cases, you will be fighting for somebody else's claim. So say your grandson has come from a different family because you've married into it. It's him that has the claim on this land. 
you would be fighting on his behalf, he would gain that land when you win. So you need to be very careful in reading this sort of stuff. So you can see he's amalgamating all his armies and marching them north. So this is a random event that pops up. Uh, we imprisoned a blasphemous pagan because we're a, a zealous defender of the church. Um, and it, it's been done. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, and what this does is it gives your uh, steward, who's a bishop, a chance to react to your decision. He may like it, he may not. So um, he's saying good work because obviously we imprisoned someone who is an enemy of the church and you gain opinion with him and you'll gain little events like that they will pop up at a regular basis throughout this game um, and it's mostly what drives the game so I'm gonna end the tutorial in a second as it's nearly got to an hour now I'll just show you this war score thing so as you can see there's a battle here between this army and this army um, they won therefore the war score went up but then there was another battle here and this guy lost so this would have put it back down again. If you hover over it, you can see you got 20.02% for winning the big fight and the little fight, which, you know, the, it was completely unbalanced. Um, he only managed to reset that back by 0.3%. You can also see down here any allies that are brought in by the, the two fight, uh, factions to help. So hopefully that's helped you guys with... Uh, getting started in this game um, I know a lot of people have said they don't really know where to to go once they've got started um, it very much depends where you pick to play if you pick somewhere like Spain there's a lot of fighting going on um, between the Christian kingdoms at the top and the Muslims below them you don't have to worry about generating claims you just go holy war charge in and fight um, it's lots of big battles, it's interesting, um, you sort of learn through doing. Uh, it, I would recommend somewhere down there, it ignores a lot of the backstabbing intrigue of the game. It, it's just full on fighting. Whereas if you're more interested in the subtleties of the politics of it, the Holy Roman Empire is a great place for that. Um, it, you basically get different styles of game depending where you play. Um, the best thing I can recommend is just playing through yourself and trying to learn it as you go, referring back to the tutorials that the game itself provides. Um, if you get stuck with a specific sort of instance, alternatively have a watch through of my playthrough and various other people's playthroughs. Um, I know personally I try to voice every single decision I make. Um, there's a few cases where I forget or just don't do it, but I, I try to explain why I'm reasoning everything. Um, at that specific moment, even if I don't cover why in the grand scheme of things I might be doing something. Um, this game's so sort of fluid and changing, it's a bit hard to have a long-term plan, really. But uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy this, Or and if you don't own the game already, give the demo a try, it's completely free. Um, you can start as the character I picked here, and there's I think there's three more to choose from, the King of Poland, um, another vassal within the Holy Roman Empire, more up north here who generally gets into more fighting and the fourth one is someone over here in the Byzantine Empire who is rather difficult to play because I, he's the brother or some relation of the the Emperor and when the Emperor dies he inherits and then all hell breaks out as everyone tries to rebel against him so I'd recommend not playing as the Byzantine Empire one on your first playthrough um, I did it and it got very confusing and very very messy but I guess it depends how life, uh, difficult you want to make life for yourself. So if I just quit out of this. Oops, that wasn't what I wanted. Uh, resign, that's the one. So this is the score I was on about. And it compares you with all the other historical dynasties. It gives you all the information of your different rulers over here. But uh, I'll just show you where the tutorials are. So it's just a button here. Uh, it's, I mean, if you missed it, then it's unfortunate. But it breaks it down. So you've got all your basics. 
and then there's an intermediate of most of them. It's worth noting the feudal system one changes, and then you've got an advanced. Um, it's a bit messy in how you step through it. it. If you start economy, you then get the option to go on to council or go on to intermediate. But if you go on to intermediate, it then doesn't come back to the basic version of the next one. So I found I went on, did economy, did intermediate economy, did advanced economy, then exited out back to this menu and went back to the basic tab and went in on the council, intermediate, advanced, back, and so on. So hopefully that helps you guys. Um, hopefully uh, that's encouraged a few of you to play this.